One of the first things that made people realize that Bitcoin might be more than just a digital currency and actually a revolutionary technological breakthrough was the idea of colored coins. Colored coins is a general term for putting arbitrary assets onto the Bitcoin blockchain. For example, if you wanted to model the concept of owning gold on the Bitcoin blockchain, you could pick some specific group of Bitcoins and make a declaration that these specific Bitcoins now represent gold, meaning at any time somebody could trade one of these specific Bitcoins to you for one bullion bar of gold. And you could track those specific coins through the network as they were traded, and the users that owned them would have the full discretion to either sell them for gold or transfer them to another person at any time. So from the user's perspective, you would essentially be having a password to your Bitcoin wallet that would control physical gold in a vault in the outside world somewhere, which is a pretty cool concept. And there is actually a company that does this, by the way, called Digix. So you can check them out if you are the kind of person who is actually interested in buying gold with cryptocurrency. But then, of course, you could expand on this idea and instead of just mapping gold to individual Bitcoins, you could map something like equity ownership in a product or a business. And that would lay the foundation for creating new kinds of transparent and decentralized governance models, which is a very interesting idea to a lot of people in the space right now. But as it turned out, Actually, implementing colored coins on top of Bitcoin was somewhat challenging to do because Bitcoin was never really meant to work like that. So making it simpler to create colored coins was one of the main reasons that Ethereum was created in the first place. Now, there is a repository on the official Ethereum GitHub page called EIPs, which stands for Ethereum Improvement Proposals. And this repository is where changes to the Ethereum protocol are submitted and discussed. But also in the issues section of the repository, people can submit drafts for creating community standards for various workflows, which are referred to as ERCs, which stands for Ethereum Request for Comments. One of the first discussions that was opened when Ethereum was launched was ERC number 20, a request for comments for formalizing a standard for creating digitized assets on top of Ethereum. And over time, the community has converged on a loose set of standards for creating these kinds of assets that is colloquially referred to as the ERC20 token standard. So why is it good to have these standards in place? Well, first off, it lets third-party application developers reliably interact with multiple different tokens, knowing that they will all share certain properties. For example, ERC-20 tokens are often listed for trading on exchanges, and it's helpful for the exchange if all of these tokens conform to the same set of standards. If you look on coinmarketcap.com right now, you can see that Augur, Economy, Gollum and Digix DAO, among others, are all ERC20 tokens that are built on top of Ethereum that are currently tradable on exchanges. It also lets applications like Etherscan, which is the most popular Ethereum blockchain explorer, give a really nice interface to all tokens that conform to this same standard, such as you know showing the total supply of tokens in the ecosystem and showing the number of accounts that ha have ownership of those tokens and a list of all transactions between token holders. Now I'm going to dive into what the token standard actually looks like by looking at a fictional solidity contract called DecipherCoin. Now the ERC20 token standard is still a living document and it is not completely set in stone, but this is the basic template for creating an ERC20 token. There are three pieces of state balances, allowances, and total supply. There are two events, transfer and approval. There's a constructor function, and then there's five methods, balance of, allowance, transfer, approve, and transfer from. So let's start to break this contract down. First, we have a variable called balances. This variable is going to be a mapping of Ethereum addresses to the current balance in Decipher coins that they have at any given time. The balance of function is going to be a very simple query lookup, which is just going to take an address as an argument and return the current balance of that address from the function. Now, when we instantiate the contract, we need to instantiate it with a specific number of coins to start with. A good way to do this is to pass it in as a variable to the constructor function. And I will pass this in as a variable called initial amount. Now, in the constructor function, I can set the balances 
of the message.sender, which will be the contract creator, equal to the initial amount. Now, you might want to not instantiate the contract creator with all the coins initially. You might want to do something like this, where the word this in this context will refer to the address of the contract. But then you would need some sort of method to extract the tokens from the contract itself. So it might be easier to just start by instantiating all the tokens into the contract creator's account, and then the contract creator can distribute them to other accounts as he pleases. The other thing that we're gonna to need to do is we're going to need to set the total supply equal to the initial amount so that at any time somebody can call this public variable and see the total supply of tokens in the contract at any time. When a user wants to transfer tokens to another user, we can use the transfer function. So this is gonna take two arguments, who you are sending tokens to, and then the amount of tokens that you wanna send. And all that we're gonna do is we're gonna adjust the balances of the message.sender to subtract the value that they're sending. We're also going to then increase the value of the address that they're sending it to. Now at the end of the transfer function, we're going to call the transfer event. Now this is the event that will let anybody that's watching the contract know that a new transfer has happened and tokens have changed hands. So we're going to call it with the message.sender, then two, and then the value, because those are the parameters that are in the event as we defined it. Now, before we actually send these tokens in the function, we're gonna to wanna to do a couple guards to make sure that the data that's input is valid. So the first obvious thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that the person sending the tokens actually has that balance in their account. So we can say that if the balances of message.sender is less than the value, let's just throw and exit out of the function. Another thing that we wanna check for is that the integer doesn't overflow in anyone's balances. Remember that the balances are 256 bit integers. So it's possible to put a really, really large number in there and overflow the memory and end up with a value that is makes no sense and is actually lower than the value that they started with. So another common thing that you're gonna see in contracts is something that looks like this. If the balances of who you're sending it to plus the value, so that's what we're going, that what's, that's what their new value would be. And if that is somehow less than the original um, balance of the two account, that means that the input was too large and there was an overflow. So we can throw out of that scenario also, just as a sanity check. And finally, because this function is expecting a Boolean return, we can return true from it at the end. Okay, now let's look at this allowances variable. An allowance is a way for a token holder to give custodian access to another Ethereum address to transfer tokens on their behalf. Okay, so why would you ever want to do this? Say for example that you want to sell your tokens on an exchange for cash. Well, chances are that you're gonna to want to go to the exchange's website and use some sort of user interface that's controlled by the exchange to actually make that transaction. You're not gonna to want to use your private key or put your private key into a system. So in order for the exchange to make that trade on your behalf, they're going to need to have a way, need a, need a way to access your tokens and have authority to transfer them. So that's what this allowances variable does. It stores a mapping. So your Ethereum address goes to a mapping of every other Ethereum address and the balance that you have given them custodian access over to transfer on your behalf. So they don't have access to all your tokens, only the ones that you whitelist. And you do that by using this approve function. So the approve function is how you give another address custodian access over some of your own tokens. And all that this function is going to do is it's going to change the allowances of the message.sender and then the spender. So we're gonna go into that variable and change this guy, which will be the spender, and we will set that equal to the value that you give authority for. Then at the end of that function, we are gonna call approval, which is the event right up here, and we're going to pass in message.sender, and then we're gonna pass in the spender, and then finally the value, and then we're gonna return true from this because it's expecting a Boolean return value. Now the allowance function right here is gonna be very similar to the balance of function. It's just a simple query lookup that's going to return the allowances, and the way that you read this, these two arguments of owner and spender, it will be what value did this owner give this spender access to, to spend on their behalf? So the way that we'll look it up is with allowances, owner, spender, and that will return the allowance given there.
Now let's look at this transfer from function. Now remember, this is the function that is called when you are spending tokens on somebody's behalf. So in this case, the owner is the person that actually owns the tokens and the message.sender variable will refer to the person transferring them on their behalf. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take the balances of the owner and we will minus equal the value. And then we're going to take the balances of two and plus equal the value. So this looks exactly like transfer, except now we're going to look into the allowances and we're gonna see if the allowances of the owner of the message.sender is going to subtract the value. So they have now used up some of that allowance. Um, then we're gonna call the transfer function and we're gonna transfer the owner to and then the value. And then finally we will return true because this is expecting a Boolean return. Now in terms of the guards that we're going to place at the top of the function, we'll do something very similar to what we did last time, which is we're going to check that if the balances of the owner is less than the value that we're trying to spend on their behalf, we're going to have to throw out of that function because that doesn't make any sense. Also, we're going to do the same kind of sanity check and check that if the balance is 2 plus the value is less than the balance is 2, then there was an integer overflow and we want to throw out of that situation also. But the other thing that we need to check is we need to make sure that the message.sender actually has enough allowance to transfer this value on the owner's behalf. So we can say if allowances of owner message.sender is less than the value that they're trying to transfer, we can throw out of that scenario also. So what we have created is a fully compliant ERC-20 protocol token, but it's pretty bare bones. And it turns out there's a bunch of common patterns for adding functionality into your token to make it more useful. One example is something called the human standard token, which adds four additional pieces of state into your ERC-20 token, name, decimals, symbol, and version. The name is gonna be the name of your token as so other people can view it. The decimals is gonna be the number of decimal places that you want one token to be able to be divided into for display purposes. The way that one ether can be divided into 18 different decimal places, which is what one way is. The symbol is gonna be the symbol of your token if it's gonna be listed on exchanges, and then the version of your token. So you could put this in the constructor function, you could pass this in as parameters, but I'm just gonna hard code it right now and say the name is going to be decipher coin, the decimals is going to be 18, which is similar to Ethereum. The symbol is going to be DCY, and then the version would be 0.1. Another common pattern is to have some sort of workflow to mint new tokens should you need to go over the initial amount that you specified in your constructor. So if we wanna make a minter workflow, we'll have one piece of state, which will be an address, um, which will be called the central minter. And then I'm going to add a modifier called only minter, which is just something that you can add to functions to um, just specify that only the minter can be calling this function. Now let's scroll down and let's add some minter functions. Um, so we're going to have one function called mint, and this is going to take an argument of uint256 of amount to mint. And in this case, we could then set the balances of the central minter um, plus equal to the amount to mint. And I forgot to say this, but let's say that only the minter can call this function, obviously. Um, then we're going to need to increment the total supply and say the total supply plus equals the amount to mint also. And then the standard for this is that we're going to also call the transfer function. And then the first address of who it's being transferred to is just going to be the this variable, which is the address of the contract. So it's basically the um, contract transferring tokens to the central minter, and this will be the amount to mint. And then we might also want to have some sort of function to transfer minter status, um, and this will be the address of the new minter. Only the minter can call this. And then all that this will do is this will set the central minter equal to the new minter. Another common pattern is if you want your token to actually be backed by Ether. So that means that users can pay actual Ether to buy your tokens, and then they can sell your tokens for Ether through your contract. So let's think through how a workflow like that might work. First, we're going to need to store two pieces of state, which we'll call the backed by Ether state. And this is going to be two variables, an integer um, that is called the buy price, and then an integer 
which is called the sell price. And these are, you know, variables defined by the contract owner that says what price of Ether one token costs and then what price um, of Ether you can sell one token for. And then we're going to add some functions. Um, which I'll go over really quickly. So something to note though, that if you're going to make a contract that's backed by Ether, you're going to need to instantiate the contract so that it has enough Ether that it could buy back all the tokens on the market if it wanted to. Meaning that if every user tried to sell their token at exactly the same time, there'd be enough Ether in the contract to cover it or else the contract would be insolvent and that would be really bad. So you might wanna have a function called set prices where the minter can then define, okay, what price can the user sell Ether for or sell a token for and what price in Ether can a user buy, um, buy a token for. Now let's look at this buy function. So if a user wanted to you know, pay Ether to buy a token on your site, you could make a function that's payable. And remember, once the user calls this function, the amount of Ether that they send with it will be in this message.value variable. So you could say the amount of tokens they're purchasing is message.value divided by buy price. And then you can then take that from the central minter's balance and take that amount and then give it to the message.sender. And then you can call a transfer function. So it's just like the minter was transferring something, but we're adding ether to the contract as well. And then when the user wants to sell their token, the central minter will then get that amount. The user will lose that amount. We'll calculate the amount of revenue, which is the amount that they're selling times the sell price. And we will actually send that ether to them using message.sender.send and then call the transfer function. So that is like a very simple workflow and all this code will be on GitHub of how you can then expand your contract to be backed by Ethereum as well. So just to try to preempt a couple questions before the end of this video, um, if you've been following Ethereum at all recently, you know that companies using ERC-20 um, compliant tokens to crowdfund their applications has become a really big thing. Um, for example, this um, company called First Blood that is making a betting spat platform for esports claims to have raised 465,000 ether through their crowd sale of their first blood token. Um, I think it's really interesting to actually look at the tokens when the companies um, do these kind of crowd sales. So you can just go onto GitHub normally and find the actual token contracts that they're using. So looking through the actual code is a really good way to kind of learn more about how these tokens work. Uh, you can also invest in them. Like you can go onto Poloniex and go ahead and try to buy things like the Augur reputation token to use on the Augur platform. Um, so should you be investing in protocol tokens? I would honestly stay about 10,000 miles away from ever doing something like that. Most of these um, companies are you know, slightly shady and it's not very clear what their future business model is gonna be. Uh, or this is just such the wild, wild west that it's just, you should really be very, very careful before ever putting real money into protocol tokens. But maybe you wanna just get on Poloniex and buy some just to play around with it and because it's really interesting. Um, so, so what are these tokens? Are they, are they securities? Is this regulated by the SEC? Um, right now, it's a complete legal gray area. This is really on the bleeding edge of like crowdfunding and legal frameworks for equity in businesses. And nobody has figured out anything about whether or not these tokens can constitute equity. Um, so it's really a gray area that is evolving. And it's really interesting to try to think about where all of this is going.